I have gotten a lot of questions about jazz theory lately, and I wanted to take the opportunity to demystify one of the most common chord progressions in jazz, the 2-5-1. Stick around, and I'm going to take you through it. I'm Brenda Earl Stokes, the owner and creator of Piano and Voice with Brenda, creative and practical resources for singers, pianists, and music teachers. So to answer the question about jazz theory, um, there's a lot of people out there who think that jazz theory is some kind of a big, hairy monster. Um, first of all, I want to say that jazz theory isn't really separate or different than classical theory, since jazz theory is really created around Western classical theory. Um, a lot of terms that you're used to using, a lot of the symbols that we use, are still very much used in jazz. The biggest difference uh, in between jazz theory and classical theory is some of the conventions we use and which aspects of the music we kind of focus on. Okay. First of all, let's describe what a chord progression is. So the word progress is in progression. So a chord progression means that the chords are moving and moving and then they're ultimately resting. And so they're progressing from moving chords to resting chords. And over the course of a piece of music, the chord, the, the harmony is resting and moving and resting and moving for the most part, um, except for some examples of modal theory, which we'll talk about at a later video. In classical music, we we might look to the 1-4-5 progression as one of those progressions that we think of a lot, okay? And in jazz, the most commonly used chord progression in straight ahead jazz is by far the 2-5-1. And in this video, I'm going to show you how this progression works and how you can learn to use it. Now, once again, the conventions are the same. So when we go from a 5-7 chord to a 1 chord, we do that in jazz as well. There's nothing that's particularly different about it. It's just sort of the context and how we play the chords is a little bit different. An important thing to understand about Western music theory is that there are some chords that are moving chords and some chords that are resting chords. Well, the resting chords are easy. We call that the tonic, okay? We call that a tonic chord. It's a home chord. It's a chord that says, I'm done. You can leave me here, okay? Then we have moving chords, and our moving chords could fit into two categories. One of them is a subdominant chord, okay? And in this case, in Western music, we think, Western classical music, we think of a four chord, okay? In our case, we're thinking of the two chord in the jazz context. And what this means is that the fa is resolving to the mi. So that means that the F of an F major chord is resolving to an E in the C chord, okay? And that's a softer resolution. It's called a subdominant, okay? The dominant resolution, which is our other moving chord, has a much more strong and, well, dominant sound. That's why it's called dominant. And in this case, it's the T resolving to the DO. So in the key of C, it's that B of the G7 chord that's resolving up to the DO or to the C in C major, okay? And our added bonus in a G, for a G7 chord is that the seventh is also resolving to a third. So that's why it's called dominant. So once again, if we're looking at that typical four, five, one progression for classical music, we're looking at basically the same function in the two, five, one, okay? Where the, um, we've got that resolution that's going on. So let's take a moment and understand where we get these chords from. So we're going to have a look at the origin of the 2-5-1 progression. And this progression comes from the major scale. And so first off, I'm just going to take our, our trusty C major scale. And I'm going to go up the scale so that you can see it. OK, hooray for finale. I use it all the time. And then the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to harmonize the scale. And we're going to harmonize it by putting stacks of thirds on each one. And for now, we're going to look at four note chords. So there's four notes. This is on D, then on E, and F, and G, and A, and B, and then back to C again. Okay, so now we're going to label these, and you could label them either by playing them on the piano, 
um, so that you could identify either by ear or by eye, or you could look at them and, and analyze them by eye. So this first chord is a C major 7 chord, okay? Then it's D minor 7. Then it's E minor 7. Then it's F major 7. Then it's G7. Then it's A minor 7. And then this next chord is B minor 7 flat 5. Sometimes it's known as half diminished, and you would put this, the symbol would be a circle with a line through it. Okay, oops. I would like to add it. Thank you. And then C major 7. Okay, so bearing in mind that every key is set up the same way because in order for something to be a major scale it has to have the same distance of intervals between each um, scale degree so this means that any key that we transpose this into will have the same succession of chords so C major 7 it'll be a minor 7 minor 7 major 7 dominant 7 minor 7 a minor 7 flat 5 and then major 7 so the way that we're going to describe this underneath is I'm going to show you this in Roman numerals. Remember I said that classical and jazz really isn't that much different? So we're going to label these in good old-fashioned Roman numerals, okay? If they were good enough for the Romans, it was good enough for me. So this is 1 major 7. This is 2 minor 7, and you can sort of remember if you know that we use um, lowercase i's for minor, okay? And then we're going to do um, 3 minor 7. Then, oops, four, four major seven. And then it's going to go to five seven, six minor seven. Okay, oops, six minor seven. Okay, and then it's going to go to seven minor 7 flat 5 again you can use half diminished if you want oops minor 7 flat 5 and then it's going to go to 1 major 7 okay ta-da so now you can transpose this into any key it's always going to be the same okay and so what's really important for us here are three things one of them is the two chord, which is here, okay, because we're going one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, right. This is the two chord, this is the five chord, and this is the one chord. So I'm going to take this information, there's the two chord, remember, D minor 7, and so I'm going to write that here. There's your D minor 7, okay. Then our five chord is here, And then I'm going to go to the one chord, which is C major 7. Now, if we want to get our money's worth, there is an alternative to C major 7. And I think it's an important one for you to learn, okay? This is C6, okay? C major 7 and C6 function exactly the same way, okay? They mean the same thing. And the reason that you would use C6 instead of C major 7 is if the melody was going to somehow clash or if you just wanted to have some, um, some a little bit of movement going on. So whenever I teach somebody the 251, I always have them learn D minor 7 to G7, C major 7 to C6. Okay, and that's a really great way to practice this. You get a little more money's worth and then you have two options for the one chord. And that's all you need to know about the 251. So here's how you're going to practice this. Your left hand is going to play the root of the chord, and your right hand is going to play the whole chord in root position. Okay? D minor 7, G7, C major 7, and then C6. Okay? Now, remember, we want to practice this in all 12 keys. So you can go towards the circle of fifths, A minor 7, D7, G major 7. Then you could go in the key of D major, etc. Okay? If you want to get fancy, you could walk a bass line, right? Any of those things that you want to do. If you want to learn how to walk a bass line, I have a video about that. I'll, I'll post the link in the comments. 
Now you understand the 251 and where it comes and how it works. And so it's your goal to practice it in all 12 keys. And you can practice this via the circle of fifths, either going the flat way or the sharp way, either clockwise or counterclockwise. You could also practice it up and down by half steps. You could practice 2-5 to C, 2-5 to D flat. And then once you've done that, we can practice voice leading our way through the progression. So there's another way that you can practice this. Instead of playing just root position, or once you've practiced the root position a bunch, here's what you can do is you can do it in inversions, okay? So with, with smooth voice leading. So this is D minor seven right here. And if we wanna find a really close version of G7, okay? All we have to do is take the top two notes and move them down to the next available scale note. And then this G7 here is actually G7 in second inversion. And then you practice C major seven, and then as always, C six. See how I did that? So D minor seven, D mi minor seven, G seven, and that's second inversion, C major seven, and C six. And practicing it this way means that you're going to have the smoothest amount of mo motion going on and it's going to help you to kind of hear the internal movement of the progression. So you can also voice lead as I showed you um, when I showed you the screen. And so you're going to go, this is D minor 7, okay? and then the top two notes are going to come down. There's the G7, okay? And so these top two notes, this is the root and the third and the fifth and the seventh. So we call this second inversion. Second inversion, root position, first inversion, second inversion, okay? And so you're gonna go D minor seven in root position to G seven in second inversion, and then C major seven and C six, okay? And then you'll do that in all the keys. So two, five to F. So you're going to practice that through all of the available keys. So the next thing that we're going to do is take a moment and have a look at how can we find these in songs. Now the first thing that you can remember is that the two chord is a minor seven chord. So if you happen to come across a minor seven chord, you can say, hmm, okay. Remember the five chord is always a dominant chord. So then you see, ah, okay, here we go. I'm seeing a minor seven a dominant seven, and then I'm seeing a major seven. Now let's make sure that they're the right chords. Um, G minor seven is indeed the two in the key of F. C seven is indeed the five chord in the key of F. So here you go, you've got a two, five, one in F major, okay? Now we'll move on, we see, oh, there's a minor seven chord here, there's a dominant chord here, and then there's a major seven chord here. So let's make sure that they um, are the correct ones. Now, another way you can look at this is that are they moving by um, fourths or by fifths? So F to B flat is indeed, you know, up by a fourth or down by a fifth. And then B flat seven to E flat major, that's also going down by a fifth, okay? So indeed, we have another two, five, one here, and you would say that this two, five, one is in the key of E flat major. Okay, so now going on a little bit further, we've got E flat minor seven, there's the two, two chord, A flat seven, that's the five chord, D flat major seven, okay? And so this is another two, five, one in the key of D flat. So Solar has 16 little bars and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine of them are two, five, ones. Okay, and this is actually a, also a two, five, one in the key of minor, but that's not for this video, that's for the next video. So now we're gonna have a look at um, another song. This is a jazz standard by Tad Dameron called Lady Bird, okay? And this is gonna be a little bit tricky because this one has some twos and fives that don't actually go to one, and that's a thing too. You can just have a two and a five. So we've got a minor seven chord going to a dominant chord. And this is actually a two and a five in the key of E flat, but you'll notice it doesn't resolve to an E flat. So this is just a floating two and a five, right? Still good to know that, okay? So for these two bars, you're kind of in the key of E flat, but you never completely resolve there, okay? And so now we're in B flat minor seven, E flat seven, 
A flat major 7, well, there's a 2, 5, 1 right there, okay, 2, 5, 1 in the key of A flat major, okay? Now, you might be thinking, well, I'm not seeing any 6s here. Well, here's the thing. Since you have know that A flat major 7 and A flat 6 are the same chords, you could choose to play one bar of A flat major 7 and then one bar to A flat 6. Okay, and that's what good jazz pianists would do. They would use those interchangeably or they, they'd use them both. Okay, moving on, look at this. We've got a minor 7 and we've got a dominant 7. So once again, are these related to each other? Well, this is a 2 and 5 in the key of G. Yep, I was waiting for you to say it. <laughs> now we're going to look here. We've got a D minor 7, a G7, and then there's a C major 7. Okay, so once again, we've found yet another example of a 2 5 1 in the key of C. Let me go to the next one. Dee da do da dwee da do. So, Cherokee, this old copy of it, has a little trick in it. Okay, so you go here F minor 7, B flat 7 to E flat major 7. Look at that. There's a 2 5 1 in the key of E flat major. And what could you put here if you wanted to substitute something? That's right, you could play E flat 6 because those two function the same. Now if we go a little bit further, here's a C minor 7 and here's a dominant chord, right? And so you might say, oh, there's a 2 5 1. Well, wait a second. This is not at all the right one, okay? Because if we were playing C minor 7 and that was the 2 chord, we'd be in the key of B flat because B flat would be 1 in the key. Okay, B flat would be 1, C minor would be 2. So is this the 5 in B flat? Nope, it is not. So I'm using this as an example that sometimes these chords can trick you. So it's important to make sure that you keep track of what, um, what the 2 and the 5 are. Are they indeed related that way? And they, what they would be, what would the 1 chord be? Okay, and the bridge of Cherokee is great because it's 2, 5, 1 to B major. And what could you stick here? B6, right? Then we've got 2, 5 in the key of A major. And then what could you put here? A6, of course. Then you've got 2, 5, 1 in the key of G major. And then what could you put here? G6, right? And so this is a great song that I use, which is why I put it in. I have a little packet that I give my students. I call it, you can see it up here, the major packet. And this has all kinds of songs that are in major that have a bunch of 2, 5, 1s in them. Learning the 2-5-1 progression is a great way of decoding the music that you're seeing in front of you. Instead of looking chord by chord by chord by chord, all of a sudden you can start to see the broader brush strokes of the composer. Okay, And practicing the 2 5 ones is a really, really great way to get inside the language of jazz. So when I'm teaching piano voicings, I like to start by teaching a voicing strategy on the 2 5 one progression and then practicing it in 12 keys. What's great about this is that once you've done that, you can then just drop them into any song where they appear. This is also an incredible way to start practicing working on improvisation. Since jazz is an oral tradition, something that so many jazz musicians have done throughout time as uh, in the history of jazz is learning from other artists. And one of the things that we do is we transcribe or we steal ideas from other artists, you know, especially um, the great masters like Miles Davis and Dizzy Gillespie and Charlie Parker. So when you're learning improvisation, one great thing that you can do is to start collecting collecting 251 patterns or licks um, and practicing them in 12 keys. And once again, as you're practicing it, you can drop them into songs. So I hope that this little tutorial gave you a stronger idea of what the 251 is, what it's for, and how you can use it in your work. If you're curious to learn more about jazz, I suggest that you check out my online course called Jazz Piano Accompaniment, where I show you absolutely everything you need to know to play authentic jazz piano. It covers everything from walking bass lines to comping figures to different voicing strategies to improvisation techniques. It's really easy to use and it's a lot of fun. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please click a like. Um, leave me a comment below and make sure you subscribe to my channel. I appreciate your support and I'll see you next time.